There's a lot to woodworking, and there's a lot that most of us don't know, especially when we start out. Now, I've been at this for 50 years, and I wish I knew the things I know now 50 years ago. So these are, are several things that are very useful to every woodworker and are things that just took me too long to learn. So let's jump in. Let's start out talking about the lumber that we buy. Most of us start off buying just, you know, regular construction lumber at our local lumber yard or home improvement center. In other words, we're buying pine one buys, maybe sometimes two buys. What do I mean by one buy? It's an inch thick, one buy. One by what? Well, four, six, eight, even 12 inches wide. This is a one by four. Now, that doesn't mean that the board that I'm holding in my hand is an inch thick or four inches wide. What it means is that it started out that way when they rough cut it. And then they go, went and ran it through a planer and possibly even a sander, smoothing it out for us and giving us a decent surface to work with. So what we end up with is a board that's three quarters of an inch thick rather than one inch, even though they still call it a one inch board. It's also, as far as width, instead of four inches, it is probably three and a quarter. Now, it used to be that that would be three and a half, but most of what I'm seeing come out of the local lumber yard lately that's supposed to be a one by four is actually three and a quarter inches wide. And it's sold by the stick, in other words, however long. So if you go in and you look on the lumber racks and you find one by four by eights, it's going to have one price. One by four by tens is going to be a little bit more, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So that's how most of us start off is buying that kind of lumber. At some point, you're going to want to start working in hardwoods. Now, hardwoods are a lot more expensive, and sometimes it's hard to equate what we're buying with hardwoods to what we're used to buying in softwoods, okay? So what does it mean? We start looking at the hardwood lumber, and we see numbers like 4-4 four, four, and a price by board feet. All right, what in the world does that mean? Hardwood lumbers are dimensioned by uh, quarters of an inch thick, okay? So when we, when we see a board that says, four, four, that's four quarters of an inch thick or one inch thick. Now, a lot of times, and it really depends in part where you're buying it from, a lot of times that actually means the board itself will be an inch thick, but it may not be well finished like that pine board, okay? This piece of cherry is a four, four piece of cherry, but it is also being sanded just like the piece of pine is so if we put them side by side, we find out that the cherry is also three quarters of an inch thick, even though it's called an inch thick, just like this was, okay? So this is 4-4 four, four cherry, right? Okay? Here's a piece of uh, purple heart. This is 5-4. Five, That's five quarters of an inch thick, okay? And it was also sanded, so it was, it was smoothed out. Here's a piece of white oak. This one I got at, this was 6-4 which meant that it was six four quarters of an inch or an inch and a half inch thick. But it was rough cut. It was not smooth. So I had to smooth it myself, and by the time I got it smoothed down, I ended up with a piece that was actually five four, or in other words, an inch and a quarter thick. So that's what you're looking at when you look at hardwood. That's the first thing you're looking at. The second thing you're looking at is board feet. What's a board foot? Remember I said when we buy the, the pine, we're buying sticks. We're buying it by however long it is. When you buy hardwoods, regardless of what kind of hardwood or where you're buying it from, you buy board feet. And they will sell you pieces that will give you the number of board feet that you're asking for. You don't go to a hardwood supplier and say, I want six one by four by eight foot uh, oak or walnut or, or mahogany or whatever it might be. They'll look at you and say, well, how many board feet do you want? Now, there's a couple of things here you got to think about when you're looking at this, okay? If you're used to planting everything based on the dimensional lumber you're used to buying, then what's going to happen is you're probably going to end up with more scrap buying it by board feet unless you specify widths and lengths. Now, you can specify widths and lengths with a lot of suppliers, but I'll tell you right now, they'll charge you more for it, okay? If, you, if you're willing to go with random stock, they will sell it, you'll get the best price, all right? You also might get wood that's got a little bit of wane on the edges, uh, but they'll discount the price for that as well. Now, if you are buying wood for stock, in other words, you're gonna keep it in your workshop until you're ready to use it, that's great. Go ahead and buy a bunch of random and, and go ahead and clean it up and have it in your shop, and then when you're ready to use it, you're ready. Okay, you got it. But if you're not buying, if you're buying for a specific project, you will probably have to specify the sizes you want in board feet. And you'll also, they'll also ask you, so they'll want to know 
how thick, so in, in 4.4 4 or 6.4, they'll want to know um, width and they'll want to know board feet. And they'll want to know minimum length, okay? You're making a tabletop, it's going to be six feet long, you certainly don't want four foot long boards. You will want to specify six foot long boards, minimum six foot long boards. What that means is that all the boards you get will be at least six feet long, but some may be eight feet long. So you might end up with a little more scrap rate, but then again, that's not really scrap because that two foot off cut's going to be useful for something, okay? So what exactly is a board foot? A board foot is any dimension that gives you 12 inches by 12 inches by one inch. If we multiply that out, that's 144 cubic inches. So this piece of purple heart, for example, this is this is 5'4". Let's for right now, let's just assume it's 4'4", four four, okay? It's 30 inches long and five and a half inches wide. For calculation sake, let's say it's 30 inches long and six inches wide. Well, 30 times six is 180. So that 144 cubic inches, we have 180 cubic inches here, a little bit more, so we have more than a board foot, okay? We've got about one and a quarter board feet. So let's, if this was selling for $20 a board foot, we would actually pay $25 for this piece of wood. So that's what you have to look at when you're buying hardwoods. I always buy excess when I'm buying hardwoods because I always assume that the pieces aren't gonna come in the size that they, I want that there will be imperfections that I don't want to deal with, like knot holes or wane, and that I'm going to have to cut around those things. Okay, that's fine. But there are certain hardwoods that I stock here in my workshop, such as oak and walnut and maple, because those are the ones I use the most. And so I will, I will buy, if I'm making a project, and I could say six feet board feet of walnut, I'll buy 10 board feet of walnut. And I've got some extra, okay? So I always end up with some extra here in the workshop. It also gives me extra in case some of the boards have got some imperfections. I can always cut around those imperfections and use the part I need and save the less desirable parts for something else. The next thing I want to talk about is moisture content. Now, all wood, when it's cut, when trees are cut down, have moisture in them. They can have a lot of moisture. As much as 50% or 60% of the tree's mass could be water. And before the wood can actually be used, a lot of that water needs to evaporate out of it. And if you buy good quality hardwood, it will have been dried, either air dried or maybe even kiln dried. If you buy dimensional lumber, construction lumber from your local lumber yard or home improvement center, there's a really good chance that that lumber is going to be um, just air dried and maybe not even properly air dried. Now I've got some boards here. This is a two by 12. This is a two by about six that I cut from this two by 12. And this is a two by four that I cut from another two by six like this. And as you can see, this is really badly warped. Now the two by 12 itself was not warped when I bought it, it was very straight, okay? But as we can see by looking at the, the warp in this particular board, there was something wrong here. All right, what was wrong? Well, there's two things that couldn't be. One is internal stresses in the wood. Maybe there's no warp on the outside because part of the board is trying to warp this way and the other part is trying to warp that way and they counterbalance each other. But when you try and cut it apart, you end up with pieces that do this, okay? The other thing that can cause that is moisture in the wood. As moisture dry, dries out of the wood or leaves the wood, it doesn't always do so evenly. And because it doesn't do so evenly, we may end up with some wood that has too much moisture in it and it'll dry unevenly causing that. Like this right here, this, this bend, this is the side that was cut, okay? Uh, I would actually, no, I'm sorry, this is the side that was cut, okay? So if we assume that this piece has a lot of moisture in it, and the piece that this came from had a lot of moisture in it. I cut this side, so this is the side the moisture is gonna escape out of faster, making it shrink up faster, which could explain why this piece is warped, okay? So I've got a moisture meter here, and I wish I had known about this sooner. I was probably woodworking for a good 40 years before I realized the need to have a moisture meter because nobody told me. Now, you can spend a lot of money on a moisture meter, but this one was less than $20 from our good friends at Amazon, okay? They all have four scales on them and uh, for different types of wood, so you want to try and find the scale that's the closest to the type of wood you're working with. Um, I need to put this on scale D, okay, so there's, because I'm, I've got pine here. 
Some will have sharp pointy probes and some will have flat probes. Now the flat probes are considered by a lot of people to be better because they don't make holes in the wood. This kind will. So if I take this and I press it up against this wood, it tells me it has a moisture content of 3.2%. That's actually really great, okay? I flip it over, I'm gonna do this side here, and I show an even lower moisture content. Now that backs up what I said a moment ago about the wood drying uneven, evenly. This side has got 0.8%, very, very dry. All right, so here's, I said this came from something like this. So what's the moisture content of this? You see, this is showing 0%. I'm going to find, which end did I cut on this? If I go into the end grain, I'm at 5.2% from this end. I'm going to flip it around to the other end. Yeah, that was the moisture, moisture end. And I'm going to take my 2x12 here. The surface of this is showing 2.4, um, 2.5%. This is the end I cut, so let me check this end in the end grain. Yeah, I'm showing pretty low there too. Okay. When you buy wood, assume, always assume, especially if you're buying it from your local lumberyard or home improvement center, always assume the wood is not dry enough. Bring it into your shop and let it dry. Put it somewhere where it's going to be horizontal, where it's going to be flat, and uh, weigh it down if you can, and just let it acclimate to your shop. Give it a week. Give it a few days at least, okay? If you can, check the moisture level when you bring it in so you know what it is. If you can have air conditioning in your workshop, or if you can have a dehumidifier in your workshop, use that to help dry the wood out. Now, I did not do that with this 2x12 when I brought it into my shop. I brought it in specifically so I could cut it up like this and found out when I did so that there was a lot of moisture in the board, not by any other reason than by seeing how it warped as it started to dry, okay? And uh, so that was a valuable thing, you know, but I really can't use that board for much of anything, you know, unless I can find a way to flatten it out which I will probably do by submersing in water and then laying it flat way down and let, giving it a chance to dry really well, okay? So a moisture meter is a great investment. Before you work with wood, you want the wood's moisture level to be below 10%. Ideally, it should be about 8 or 9%. That's the level it should be at before you work it, okay? If it's not, give it some time to dry before you start your project. Projects are only going to come out as well as every step that goes into that process. And that generally starts with measurement and cutting. Now, how accurate your measurement needs to be and the marking for that measurement needs to be really depends on the type of project you're doing. If you're framing in a room, uh, cutting a, a two by four off, an eighth of an inch long or short really doesn't matter. But if you're building a picture frame, we're not talking eighth of an inch, we're talking down in thousandths of an inch. We're really trying to get the same level of accuracy out of tools that aren't designed for it as machinists try and get out of tools that are designed for it. Now, a lot of woodworkers will use a tape measure for everything. Me, I only use a tape measure when I have to use it, and that means it's something that's big enough I need the tape measure for. For most of my measurements, I use a steel ruler. Why? Because I need that level of accuracy. This steel ruler, uh, it's only 12 inches long, so if I need something longer, I actually have one that's 24 inches long as well. Uh, and I have a steel square that's also graduated in inches and so that I can, I can use it for measurement. Using a steel ruler gives me a much more accurate location. And this is a etched steel ruler, not a printed steel ruler. There's a huge difference, okay? Um, so that's part of the game. The other part of the game is what are we marking with? Carpentry pencils, which a lot of guys use, are out the window as far as I'm concerned, and so are regular lead pencils that you sharpen. I only use mechanical pencils. This one's seven-tenths of a millimeter, and this one is half a millimeter, okay? They give me a much finer line. Now, for that li fine line to be good, I need to angle the pencil into the ruler, okay? See, what's going to happen is, is that 
the center of that line is always going to be half of the lead thickness away from my ruler. So if I put that right on the mark and I angle it this way, I might end up with my mark being a whole millimeter away from where I want it to be. If I'm cutting picture frames or I'm assembling some, a box or I'm making a little shelving unit for knickknacks and I don't want any gaps in it, that half a millimeter is huge. So if I want to do it right, I need to angle that in. Okay, And I, I can look at these two marks right here just from the angle of the way I held my pencil are a millimeter apart. Now, what about if I need more accurate than that? The ideal is what's known as a marking knife. And there's a couple different styles of these. This is the one I use. It's flat on one side and beveled on the other and very sharp. Okay, This is used when I'm doing joinery. If I'm doing box joints, dovetail joints, even lap joints, and I need to make a mark, this is more accurate because there's a flat side here that goes right up against my rule. So then when I mark, I am marking exactly where that rule is. That's the most accurate way you can measure for woodworking. So if you need the accuracy that you would need to make good wood joinery, hand cut joinery of some sort, use a marking knife. Don't even try with a mechanical pencil. Speaking of measuring and marking things, once you get a project going, you want to forget about using your tape measure, using your ruler, even using the dimensions you've got on your plans. When things start going together, you want to start measuring off the workpiece itself, like this child's workbench that I built. If I want to add a shelf in here in the middle, and I measure it, or I go to my drawing, and I cut it, I end up with this shelf right here. That doesn't fit. Why? In the process of building, you always end up with things coming out just a shade different. It's what's known as tolerances. The tolerance, okay? We want a piece that's say 8 inches long or 18 inches long. Well, when you actually cut it, maybe you're going to get a 64th of an inch off. Well, you do that two or three times, now all of a sudden you're a 16th of an off. Okay? It happens. It's reality. It's called tolerance stack, the way the tolerances stack up. And, and it's something that's dealt with in industry, not just in our workshops. So rather than going to my drawings and say, oh, this piece needs to be 32 inches long or whatever it is, go to the, the work, the actual piece you're building, and measure it. Now, there's a better way to do it, either than measuring it with a ruler or tape measure, and that's just mark it off of the piece. Let's say for this same shelf, I need a couple of supports, okay? So this is going to be the supports. Rather than even measuring this width to do it, I can just take this piece here, put it where it's going to go, and mark it. And now I know exactly where to cut it, because that mark is based off of this piece rather than off the drawing. This is something that's going to save you a lot of hassles and a lot of headaches because you end up with pieces that are cut the right size rather than to some theoretical size. Just a little bit ago, I said that when we buy our dimensional lumber, it isn't always what we think it is, right? We buy a 1 by 8 and it's not, one, it's not 8 inches wide. It used to be they were 7 and a half inches wide, now they're 7 and a quarter inches wide. But they may not be exactly 7 and a quarter inches wide. Maybe it's going to be 7 and 5 sixteenths inches wide. And so if I measure it, if I assume it's seven and a half inch wide and I cut this, it's going to be too long. If I assume it's seven and a quarter and I cut it, it's going to be too short. If I put it up there and get it exactly where it's going to go and mark it with my pencil, that line is exactly where I need to cut every single time. Relative measurements. They'll save you a lot of headaches. One of the things that affects every single cut we make is what's known as saw kerf. What's saw kerf? That's the material that is cut out of the whatever it is we're cutting by the thickness of the saw blade itself. If you look at my radial arm saw here, there's a slot in the fence, and that's where the, the blade comes through. That's the material that's removed on every single cut. So I want, if I go to cut this board down, it's going to eliminate some material that I won't be able to use. I've got to keep that in mind when I'm setting up for my cuts, when I'm designing my projects, when I'm buying material to make those projects. I have a two foot long board here, and let's say I want to cut this in half and make two one foot boards out of it. It's not going to happen because of saw curve. So this slot here is the width of the cut that my saw makes. It's not quite an eighth of an inch. It's about a hundred thousandths of an inch thick. An eighth would be 125 thousandths. So I've got a couple choices I can make. 
if I try and cut right on the line, 12 inches, then both my pieces are going to be a little short. If I try and cut on this side of the line, I've got the line side lined up with this side of the notch, this piece will be 12 inches long and this piece will be a little less than 12 inches long. If I try and cut on this side, this piece will be 12 inches long and this piece will be a little less. There's no way I can get two foot long pieces out of this two foot long piece because of my blade thickness. And that's true with any blade. A bandsaw will have a narrower saw curve, but it'll still have one. So why does this really matter for us? Okay, let me give you a, a practical idea, okay? Let's say you're gonna make some shelves for your workshop, your garage, your basement, your storage shed, whatever, okay? Typically we would make those out of, say, two by four framing and maybe half inch plywood for the decking. That's pretty common. All right, we want to get the best utilization of our material. So we're using four by eight sheets of plywood and we'll make the shelves eight feet long. And we might think to make them two feet deep or maybe a third of a sheet of plywood, save ourselves a little material and make them 16 inches deep. Here's the problem. To get 16 inches, three 16 inch deep shelves out of a 48 inch piece of plywood is actually impossible because we'll have two saw curves. If we assume an eighth of an inch thickness for the saw blade, that means to get uh, three shelves like that, we actually need 48 and a quarter inches. Now, that's not an insurmountable problem. What it means is that instead of making our shelves 16 inches, we make them 15 and 7 eighths, okay? And that'll give us what we're after. I mean, the one eighth of an inch isn't gonna make a difference in the, in the shelf size, but it is something we have to consider. Going back to that sort of example, we've got a, uh, we need a bunch of two foot long pieces of two by four for that project or some other project, okay? We start cutting them up and we take an eight foot two by four and we make three cuts and we have two pieces that are two feet long and one piece that's uh, one foot 11 and seven eighths, no, five eighths inches long. Why? Well, the three uh, saw curves came out of that one. So we always have to keep this in mind when we're designing and when we're building our projects. Where's, where's that saw curve coming from? And make sure that we utilize it correctly. Now, here's something else that goes hand in hand with that. If you want to make a really accurate cut, and there's a lot of things we do in woodworking where those really accurate cuts are important, because if your piece of wood is, say, you know, maybe it's a shelf or something, or it's a, the piece going between drawers on a dresser, if, if it's got to be, say, three feet long and you cut it at three feet, you might end up with two feet 11 and 15 sixteenths or 31 30 seconds of an inch, and you'll end up with a little gap at the end. Why is that? Well, the, the material we're working with, although it is dead, it still expands and contracts a little bit. So the secret is sneak up on your cut. Here's what I mean. I've got a line here at 12 inches on this board, okay? So rather than set up my saw and cut it right at 12 inches, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna back off maybe a 16th of an inch or so, and I'm gonna make my cut there. Okay, now I'm moving the material over just a bit. And I can see I'm just kind of barely on that line. And I'll move it another smidgen. And now I know I've got a cut that's right at 12 inches. Keep your tools sharp. Now, what am I talking about? I'm talking about anything that cuts wood. That can be drill bits, saw blades, router bits, chisels, planes, anything that you're using to cut wood, you need to keep it sharp. Now you can assume that when it comes in from the factory, it's going to be relatively sharp, especially carbide tip tools. Drill bits, even though they're not carbide, will be fairly sharp as well. But they won't be as sharp as they could be. Now the, you probably can't sharpen the saw blades you get yourself. I mean, I know there are guys that do that, but most of us are not really set up for sharpening saw blades. If I need to sharpen, say, saw blades for my table saw, I either replace the blade or I send it out to some place that specializes in sharpening saw blades. But what about everything else? Well, when we're talking about chisels and planes, don't assume they're gonna come in from the factory sharp enough. Yes, they will come in from the factory sharp, but that's not sharp enough for things like fine joinery, okay? If you're gonna be doing, say, dovetail joints and you'll be using chisels to clean out your dovetails, you're gonna want those things as sharp as you can possibly get them so that they'll slide through the wood easier. 
factory sharp isn't good enough. You'll need to take it to a honing stone and sharpen it. Likewise, planes coming in from the factory will be sharp, but they really won't be sharp enough for their need. You need to go to the honing stone for those. And that's something you need to do fairly regularly. How regularly it depends on how much you use the tools and what kind of wood you're using them for. Now, you can even sharpen uh, router bits, even though they're carbide. All router bits have a, a, a flat surface, which is the surface that is actually doing the cutting. And that's what's going to get dull, if anything. All you got to do is take that flat surface, look at the bit and see where it is, and a diamond plate, and just rub it on there. Lay it flat on there and rub it on there. And, uh, and you'll be able to see what material is being removed. You don't need to remove a lot because not, not a lot will, uh, will have gotten damaged. This, I can see from this, though, just from doing this, that I've got a few nicks in this blade or this bit, I mean, so. How often do I do this? Just when I feel like it, I need it. And the biggest indicator of need is that I'm getting some tear out in my wood, okay? So keep in mind that all your tools need to be sharp. Take your planes or take your chisels, look at the blade, look for light reflecting off of that cutting edge. If you see light reflecting off the cutting edge, that tells you it's flattened out some and it's dull. Now it's time to sharpen it. A really common problem for, especially for new woodworkers, is splitting wood when they're fastening it together. Now, most of us, when we start out, we're using either plywood or dimensional lumber, and we're putting it together with screws. And there's nothing wrong with using those materials, and there's nothing wrong with using the screws to put it together. But there's a strong possibility of it splitting. You know what I mean? You take your your screw and you try and connect two boards together. Maybe I'm making a drawer bottom, maybe I'm making a box, maybe I'm making a toy box. And what I succeed in doing is splitting my board. Okay, why is that happening? Well, basically what's happening is, is that the screw is acting as a wedge going between that grain and pushing it out, okay? So we need to fix that somehow. Well, the easiest way is to drill a pilot hole for the, for the screw to go into. Now I can take a screw and run it in there with much less chance of splitting it out, okay? What's even better is to drill what's known as a clearance hole in the first piece and a pilot hole in the second piece. Now the clearance hole needs to be big enough so, so that you can pretty much slip the screw through there. Maybe it's gonna catch some, but it's really the threads are really not digging into the wood. The pilot hole is the body of the screw, what we call the minor diameter, uh, the root or the root diameter. It's without the threads. And its purpose is to make room for the body of that screw to go into. For a uh, number eight, uh, like what we call a drywall screw or construction screw, an eighth of an inch is the right size to use. Now there's an even easier way to do that, and that's to buy drill bits that are tapered. And these drill bits combine a pilot hole, a clearance hole, and a countersink all in one, and they come in a couple of different sizes so that you can have them for the different size screws that you might use in your woodworking projects. Gluing. I know a lot of people who have trouble gluing two boards together. I'm specifically talking about edge gluing, okay? Like, you know, we're making a tabletop. That'd be an awful small table, but... All right, there's a few different things that we want to consider here. Number one is we want to consider how much glue Second is how much pressure and thirdly gluing or cleaning excess glue off. So let's talk about all three of them. Some people say you should put glue on both mating surfaces and some people say that you should only put it on one mating surface. Well, when you look at what the manufacturers say, they say put it only on one mating surface. I think I'll go with what they say because they're the experts. Now PVA wood glue, the kind of wood glue we all use, works by soaking into the wood's pores. And so you've got to have a good clean surface. If you've tried gluing it and your glue joint failed or you had to take it apart for some reason, you've got to clean the glue off, literally scraping it off so that you have wood pores for that to soak into. Now I've put a thin film of glue on this one side. That's probably about as far as I can spread the glue. And that's enough. And we'll know it's enough because we'll see a little bit of glue squeeze out when we put it together. But we don't need to see a lot. All right, so the next question is pressure. Now here's some place where I see a lot of people just bearing down with their clamps, trying to get their glue joint to come together. 
And the problem isn't that they're, they need that much pressure. The problem is, is that their, their edge joints aren't even, they aren't straight. It is essential when you're going to do a glue up that you take the time to make sure that your edges glue up, dry fit it, make sure they meet up properly before you even get close to the glue. Otherwise, it's going to, it's going to cause you trouble. All right. So if you've got them properly put together, how much pressure do you need? Not a lot. I don't care if you're using parallel action clamps, if you're using regular screw clamps, if you're using uh, F clamps that are screw type, or if you're using these, uh, these quick action clamps, it's all the same. You don't need a lot of pressure. It's, the idea isn't to see if you can crush the wood together. The idea is to take up any extra gap in there. Now you notice I'm just using my fingertips here on these clamps to tighten this up. That's all the pressure you need. If you've got to go with more than that, then you're using too much. Okay. Now I can tell I've got enough pressure because I'm seeing the glue squeeze out. Here's another way of telling. Okay, if you're using these clamps, you just about can't overpressure it because you'll destroy the clamp. These aren't designed for high pressure. So if you just bring this in as far as it will comfortably go, and these are cheap clamps, by the way. These are these are Harbor Freight cheap clamps. Bingo. That's all the tighter you need to go. If you've got to go tighter because, oh, I've got to close up that gap, then the problem isn't the glue, the, the clamping pressure. The problem is your boards are not properly prepared. Finally, we do have glue squeeze out. How do we do with that glue squeeze out? There are two schools of thought on this. One is that you clean that off while it's still wet. The other is you wait till it dries and then you clean it off. Okay, let's talk about the difference. If you clean off while it's still wet, there's a really good chance, since this glue is intended to soak into the pores, that it's going to get into the pores of the wood around your glue joint, and there it will stay. And then when you go to try and stain it or varnish it, you'll end up with a visible stain. Okay? If you're going to put an opaque stain on there, like painting it, it doesn't matter. But if you're going to do something where you're going to have a transparent or semi-transparent finish, it does matter. If you're going to try and clean it off while the glue is still wet, you have to literally flood it with water enough that you clean off all the glue. Okay? Otherwise, you've got to let the glue dry and then clean it off. And that usually means using a chisel to clean it off. Okay? What a lot of woodworkers will do, especially experienced woodworkers, is they'll leave it clamped up like this for a half hour to an hour, scrape the glue off, put the clamps back on, and just let it sit that way. That way, the glue isn't totally hard, but it's, it's hard enough that it's not going to smear all over the place, but it's still soft enough that it'll, scrape, it'll cut easily to do the cleanup. Let's talk sanding for a minute. I don't care what kind of finish you're going to use on your project or on a piece of wood. The finishing process starts with sanding. And if your sanding isn't good, your finish is not going to be good. This goes for painting as well as it does for varnish, lacquer, shellac, epoxy, any other sort of finish that you put on wood. Okay, so what's the big deal about sanding? Well, there's a couple of different things here. Okay, I've got just a, a thin piece of oak right here. And if we look at this piece of oak, there's a couple burn marks on it here. There's some rough areas on it. And uh, this side looks really nice, but if I run my hand across it, it feels literally like it's just sanded. I mean sand, it feels like feeling this sandpaper, all the little bumps on it, okay? All of that's got to be smoothed out before I put any sort of finish on it. Nowadays, most people use a random orbital sander, and that's the way I would recommend going. If you're going to buy one sander for your workshop, make it a random orbital sander. And you can buy sandpaper for that in a variety of different grits. Okay, so what are these different grits doing for us? The grit tells us how coarse the cutting action, and that, of course that's dependent on the size of the grit itself on here. I've got sandpaper here that's at 60, 80, 120, 1, no, 220, and 320, okay? When would I use all these? Well, I would start off a board like this that's a bit rough. I would start off with 60 grit. That's the roughest I've got to get rid of all the damage, these burn marks, this rough part here, the roughness on the back, burns over here, all of that I would get rid of with 60 grit. That's all I would try and do with it. And then I'd step up. Now, 
there are other grits than these here. There's 100, I've got 60, 80, and then the next one I've got is 120. Well, there's 100 as well, okay? Uh, then next is 220. Well, there's, uh, there's 150 and there's 180. So there's, there's all sorts of different grits. The rule of thumb is you can skip over one grade, and that's about as far as you can go. In other words, I've got 60 here, 80, 120. I can jump from 60 to 120, but what I usually do is go from 60 to 100. I usually don't use 80. And then from 100, I'll go to probably, I'll skip over 150 and go to 180, and I'll finish up with 220. I rarely use 330 except as a way of sanding something very lightly between coats, okay? Some people tell you you need to hand it to 324, 40, 6,000, whatever. If the, the piece is going to be waxed and polished, yeah, they've got a point. But if it's going to get any sort of a film finish, and that means paint, varnish, lacquer, shellac, anything that's going to go on the, the wood that's going to sit on the surface, the, the finest you need to go is 220 with any of those. And the reason for that is, is that the finish itself is going to fill in those t tiny irregularities at that point. Sanding it any smoother, all it's going to do is waste time. And in reality, it's going to make a worse surface to use to put your... Uh, your finish onto because they won't have enough to, to bite to grab onto so it can hold. Okay, one of the nice things about random orbital sanders is they have a velcro base which means that you can replace your sanding disc. The old vibratory standards which are still around all over the place usually use uh, um, self stick pads and those self stick pads when you take them off you have to throw them away. All right. The other big deal with sanding is your sanding speed. And you see a lot of people doing this, and they're just going back and forth and back and forth like this with their sander as if that makes a difference. Ideal speed is to move the sander at about one inch per second, like this. Now, if we look at my bench stop, we see sawdust here, so we know that we're getting something off. But if we look at the board, we still have our burn marks. We still have some rough area here, although it's not as rough as it was. Okay, you go out back over it and you do it again. The one sanding grit you're going to spend the most time with is the coarsest sanding grit that you're using on that piece of wood. Looking at this after that second time, I still have burn mark here, but the burn mark here is gone. And this area that was rough here at, at the end is much better. It still needs some more work. Okay. So when I'm talking about that one inch per second, that's really more for your other grits. Your first grit you're, you your, you're cleaning up the wood with, yes, still go at one inch inch per second but realize that you're probably gonna have to go over it more than once to get the results you want okay let me flip it over to this other side that I said felt like it was sandpaper and let's see what our 60 grit does to that at one inch per second In one pass, I've removed all that roughness. I can still feel it down here where I didn't sand, but all the rest of it, it's gone. This uh, part is ready to go on to the next grit. So I would probably skip over my 80 and go to my 120. Do it once like that, then I'd go to my 220 and i do it. And that's all the sanding this piece would need to be ready for finishing, at least on this side. The other side, that's another story. I still have to do some more work on it, unless this is going to be a hidden side. Now here's something to keep in mind. 
Whenever you're finishing wood, you want to finish both sides. Maybe only one side is going to be visible, and in many cases, that's the way it'll be. But you want to seal the other side as well, okay? So let's say this is a piece of some piece of furniture, okay? And this is going to be my face side. All right, great. This side will get three, four, six coats of finish on it. This side will get one or two. That's going to seal the wood and keep it from absorbing moisture, but it's not going to make it look as good as what I'm going to do to this side. Last thing I want to share with you is about applying stain to wood. A lot of people have trouble applying stain, and that's not surprising because stain can be really difficult. It can be very uncooperative, and a lot depends on the type of wood. Now, you know, you get those little color samples. You can get the pamphlets. Sometimes you can look at color samples online. You can even see little boards of stained pieces there in the hardware store or the lumber yard. And they give you an idea of the color, but they're not an accurate representation. And the reason they're not an accurate representation is because there's an awful lot that depends on the wood that you're applying that stain to. Now I've got some, some stain here. This color is called espresso. And I just kind of picked it randomly from the various colors I have available. And I'm applying it to three different pieces of wood here. The first piece here is pine. The second here is some softwood plywood, which is, should be veneered with some sort of a, of a type of pine or conifer. And this third piece is a piece of oak plywood. So the, the face veneer on it is oak. And I'm, I'm applying it as much as possible, exactly the same on all three pieces. Okay, and then we'll, we'll wipe off the excess. Okay, and as you can see looking at this piece of pine, it really didn't change the color all that much. Compared to that, this piece of plywood, which is also pine, was changed extensively. Okay, and then finally here's our oak. And it was also changed extensively. I'm going to put the three of them here side by side so you can see the difference. Why is there such a difference? Because a lot depends on the grain of the wood. Pine is a difficult wood to, to stain because it's, it's a rosinous wood, and the rosin of the wood will make it difficult to have the, the stain soak in, and will also give us some splotchiness. You notice we've got a darker spot here and some lighter parts down here, okay? Oak is a very porous wood, so it's very receptive to stains, okay? Especially the open grain part of the wood. Maple is another problematic wood, and I don't have a piece of maple here because it's not very porous at all, so the stain doesn't soak into it well. So you always want to test the stain out on the wood that you're going to use. And when I say that, I'm not talking about, oh, well, I made it out of pine. Here's a piece of scrap pine sitting around. I'll just test it on that. No, you want an offcut from the same wood that you use because pine will vary. There are a lot of different kinds of pine, and they aren't going to accept the stain the same. So you want to make that, that test piece out of whatever wood you are using. That's the only way you're going to know what it's really going to look like. So there you've got a 10 key things that every woodworker needs to know. Does this mean this is everything you need to know? No, this isn't even everything you need to know to get started. These are just key things I see a lot of people struggle with that are important things for all of us to know. Hey, I've been at this for 50 years and I'm still learning. And you will find that as you continue in your woodworking, uh, you're going to find new things that you're going to learn. If not, you lose half the fun because those new things you learn allow you to do new and better projects. And isn't that something we all want to do?